Ruskin said, great nations write their autobiographies in three manuscripts. The book of their deeds, the book of their words, and the book of their art. Not one of these books can be understood unless we read the two others, but of the three, the only trustworthy one is the last. On the whole, I think this is true. Looking at those great works of Western man, and remembering all that he's achieved in philosophy, poetry, science, lawmaking, it does seem hard to believe that European civilization can ever vanish. And yet, you know, it has happened once. All the life-giving human activities that we lump together under the word civilization have been obliterated once in Western Europe, when the barbarians ran over the Roman Empire. Uh, for two centuries, the heart of European civilization almost stopped beating. We got through by the skin of our teeth. In the last few years, we developed an uneasy feeling that this could happen again. And advanced thinkers, who even in Roman times thought it fine to gang up with the barbarians, have begun to question if civilization is worth preserving. Well, this is why it seems to me a good moment to look at some of the ways in which man has shown himself to be an intelligent, creative, orderly, and compassionate animal. And the time to begin looking is the time when the old world of Greece and Rome had collapsed and the new world of Western Europe had not produced anything that one could call civilization. What is civilization? I don't know. I can't define it in abstract terms yet. But I think I can recognize it when I see it and I'm looking at it now. If I had to say which was telling the truth about society, a speech by a minister of housing or the actual buildings put up in his time, I should believe the buildings. But this doesn't mean that the history of civilization is the history of art, far from it. Great works of art can be produced in barbarous societies. In fact, the very narrowness of primitive society gives that ornamental art a peculiar concentration and vitality. At some time in the ninth century, one could have looked down into the river Seine and seen the prow of a Viking ship coming up the river. Looked at today, it's a powerful work of art. But to the mother of a family trying to settle down in her little hut, it would have seemed less agreeable, as menacing to her civilization as the periscope of a nuclear submarine. A powerful work of art, a more moving uh, to most of us than this Greco-Roman head. And yet this is from the figure that was once the most admired piece of sculpture in the world, the Apollo of the Belvedere. Well, whatever its merits as a work of art, the Apollo surely embodies a higher state of civilization than the Viking prow. The northern imagination takes shape in an image of fear and darkness the Hellenistic imagination in an image of harmonized proportion and human reason. At certain moments, man has felt the need to develop these qualities of thought and feeling so that they might approach, as nearly as possible, to an ideal of perfection. He's managed to satisfy this need in various ways, through myths, through dance and song, through systems of philosophy, and through the order that he has imposed on the visible world. The children of his imagination are also the expressions of an ideal. Western Europe inherited such an ideal. It had been invented in Greece in the 5th century before Christ and was without doubt the most extraordinary creation in the whole of history. So complete, so convincing, so satisfying to the mind and the eye that it lasted practically unchanged for over 600 years. Of course, its art became very stereotyped and conventional, but there it was. The same architectural language, the same imagery, the same theatres, the same temples. At any time for 500 years, you could have found them all round the Mediterranean, in Greece, Italy, Asia Minor, North Africa, 
or in the south of France, where I am now. This building, the so-called Maison Carré at Nîmes, is a little Greek temple that might have been anywhere in the Greco-Roman world. That world must have seemed absolutely indestructible. And of course, some of it was never destroyed. This aqueduct, not far from Nîmes, was materially beyond the destructive powers of the barbarians.